conflicting stories, throat surgery, destitution, uh, overblown egos, and cartwheels across sports cars. It's all part of today's number 180s rock anthem. The singer first recorded this song in 1982, and it went nowhere. Then he was on the cusp of a breakthrough record when he had to have throat surgery, and he didn't think he'd ever be able to sing again. He was $3 million in debt, and his label wouldn't even give him the cash to make a music video to promote the new record. Yet somehow, he overcame. He dusted off that 1982 recording, and he gave it new life on his way to world domination. It's a great story, how he came out on top, coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you missed the days at Classic MTV and VH1, this is your place. Nostalgia all the time. Subscribe to our channel right now. Click the bell so you can be a permanent part of our music nostalgia daily. To get even more footage and to become a producer of this channel to help us keep the music alive, make sure to check us out on Patreon below. When one is trying to get the true account of the provenance of anything, especially a piece of art that involved the input of more than one person, an unusual phenomenon often takes place called the Mandela Effect. The Mandela Effect, that refers to when a large number of people share a false memory, originally attributed to the existence of multiple universes. The late film producer Robert Evans once quipped, there are three sides to every story, my side, your side, and of course the truth. When telling the story of White Snake's retrospective greatest hit, Here I Go Again, the Mandela Effect is in full force. As lead singer and co-founder David Coverdell likes to say, everyone has a Here I Go Again story. Here I go again on my own. Coverdell was hired as the lead singer for Deep Purple to replace the disenchanted Ian Gillen in 1973. He left Deep Purple in 76, and he co-founded Whitesnake. This happened in 78. One of the co-founders of Whitesnake was veteran blues guitarist uh, Bernie Marsden. While working on material for the album Saints and Sinners, Marsden presented a rough draft of a song that he was noodling on called Here I Go Again. According to Marsden, he had the Here I Go Again line, along with some verses that you know needed some work. Bernie added that Coverdale kept the title, and he finished the lyrics for the song. Uh, David Coverdell's story, true to form, is quite different from Bernie Marsden's. Over countless interviews on the subject of the inception of Here I Go Again, uh, David Coverdell has maintained that he wrote the song in 1981 about the breakup of his marriage to his first wife, Julie Burkowski. David recalls being on holiday with Julie and uh, their young daughter in southern Portugal uh, when issues between the couple led them to sleeping in separate rooms. It was during that tense experience that he began to write this song, Here I Go Again. Uh, the original version of Here I Go Again was a focal track for the Saints and Sinners LP in 82 as the lead single from that record. Now the album broke the top 10 in the band's native UK, but the single hit the wall, went to number 34, and there was no fanfare to speak of in America. Uh, Coverdell called Saints and Sinners his contractual <laughs> obligation album. He was totally dissatisfied with the musicianship on that particular record. Now, two years later in 1984, Whitesnake released their sixth studio LP, Slide It In, and the band began to get some traction in the US, particularly with the single Slow and Easy. Uh, that went to number 17 on the mainstream rock chart. Seemed as if uh, Whitesnake was poised for breakthrough success on the very next album. In the U.S., Whitesnake was signed to Geffen Records in 83 by legendary A&R executive John Kolodner. Now remember, we just talked about uh, Kolodner a bit ago. He was one of the architects behind Aerosmith's big comeback in the late 80s and one of the great record men of his time for sure. It was Kolodner's responsibility to see that Whitesnake deliver their next album in 1985. Kolodner's involvement with Whitesnake was complete. The choice of songs to record, the selection of the studio and producers, the art for the album cover, everything. A new White Snake album was a huge part of the label's annual revenue projections for 85 and 86. However, there was deep trouble on the horizon that threatened to derail the entire project. Even though White Snake had six studio albums under their belt and a pretty solid tour base, the band was actually destitute. 
Coverdale himself was millions of dollars in debt, $3 million to be exact. To make matters worse, Coverdale was afflicted with a vicious sinus infection that required him to receive nasal surgery in 1985. Uh, he was unable to use his vocal instrument for nearly nine months. Coverdale honestly believed that his singing days were over. And for a while, it, it was touch and go. Seemed that the breakthrough record might never see the light of day. But luckily, David Strope finally healed and he got his voice back uh, slowly but surely. And he was able to finish the vocals for the record in uh, August of 86. And when David was finished recording, he actually sacked his entire band, including John Sykes, who co-authored two of the forthcoming album's biggest singles, Still of the Night and Is This Love. I mean, the contempt between Sykes and Coverdell has been so intense that the two have not spoken since Sykes was unceremoniously dismissed. Before the release of the 87 LP Whitesnake, they had only one band member left, David Coverdell. The bills related to the making of the album, they were mounting, and there was no revenue coming in for the band to offset these charges. Believe it or not, like I said, Coverdell, $3 million in debt, and he was getting poorer by the minute. I mean, conditions got so dire that Coverdell was an uninsured motorist, unable to pay his premiums, and he couldn't check out of the Mondrian Hotel in West Hollywood, you know, where he was living, because he couldn't pay the bill. Coverdell resorted to singing cheesy jingles for the New York Seltzer Company to bring in just a little bit of cash. I'm sure it's something that he was uh, not happy about being stuck with. Speaking of jingles, I'm lucky that I have an amazing sponsor that I love to talk about, Zenny. The glasses that I always wear. It's truly amazing you can get a complete pair of prescription glasses starting at only $6.95. They are a trusted brand on the market, finishing number one in customer service for the fifth year in a row. And with a 30-day peace of mind return, it's amazing. You can click on our link below or download their new app and design your very own pair, Zenny. Get a pair today. Now, the executives at Geffen, including Kalodner and David Geffen himself, were tired of the delays and the, the, the demands of David Coverdell. And they refused to pay for the video for the first single, Still of the Night. Uh, their enthusiasm and their funding it was circling the drain. The White Snake album that was on the release dock for 85 was more than two years overdue. The status of the name White Snake with Geffen was tenuous at best. Even Kalodner was in fear of losing his job. It was uh, the proverbial make or break time for Whitesnake and for David Coverdell. And everyone associated with the Whitesnake album really across the board. Desperate to get money to produce the, the video for Still of the Night, uh, David Coverdell actually met with an up and coming video director, Marty Kalner, with his hat in hand. Uh, Kalner, whose career in music videos began with the iconic clip for We're Not Gonna Take It by Twisted Sister. He really liked Coverdell, and he liked the music. He was aware that Geffen was not going to pay for anything other than a bare-bones production. So he decided to front David Coverdell the money and pay for the creation of the entire video for Still of the Night. It was uh, an incredible break, to say the least, proving to be a miraculous game-changer for David Coverdell and White Stake. The finished video for Still of the Night was presented to millions of viewers uh, as the hot clip of the week at MTV, and White Snake's fortunes immediately soared. Based on the subsequent surge in record sales, Geffen approved a budget for two additional music videos uh, for The Ballad Is This Love and For Here I Go Again. Still of the Night was uh, a hit at mainstream rock, it climbed to number 18, and then came the second and third incarnation of the Coverdale Marsden composition, Here I Go Again. Listen to this. So amazingly, David Coverdell did not want Here I Go Again on the 87 album. It's mostly because it was an old song and he felt it, it had its day. David grumbled that putting Here I Go Again on the new record would be a prostitution of his older work. But Kalodner very brilliantly insisted. He knew it would be a hit. He made the song's inclusion a specific deal point for uh, Geffen's contract with Whitesnake and you know, Coverdell didn't have much of a choice there. Actually, Kalodner's plan was to re-record Here I Go Again and, you know, transform the track into a hit for the American market. The overhaul of the song from the original 82 recording swapped the, the organ excerpt 
played by John Lord in the intro, in favor of a modern synthesizer intro performed by Don Ayer. The rhythm pattern, you know, was slightly changed, again, to make it more contemporary and less bluesy than the original. They also scrapped the drum sequence that set up the bridge and was repeated in the outro of the predecessor. The synthesizer and rock guitars were much hotter in the update. One of the most noticeable alterations from the two versions was of course the lyric change from Like a Hobo I Was Born to Walk Alone to the revised Like a Drifter I Was Born to Walk Alone. The main reason for this word swap was because Coverdell didn't want to be mistaken, uh, you know, for a gay slur when he sang like a hobo. Plus, Drifter, I think, sang a little better. Uh, the lineup of musicians that played on the second version of Here I Go Again included some really heavy hitters. Of course, the magnificent Coverdell on lead vocals. There was Neil Murray on bass, John Sykes rhythm guitar and backing vocals. Adrian Vandenberg performed the song's tasty guitar solo. There was also former Journey drummer Ainsley Dunbar on drums. Don Airy, like I said, played the synthesizer. And then Bill Cuomo provided additional keyboard parts. Uh, the album, that was produced by Mike Stone, who also produced uh, Journey, and the great Keith Olsen, Fleetwood Mac, and a few others uh, who he'd produced. They had both achieved elite status in the record business. At the insistence of Kolodner, there was yet a third version of Here I Go Again that was billed as the 87 radio mix. This one was a tighter, brighter mix to procure crossover top 40 airplane. Now remember, Coverdell fired everybody after the second recording of Here I Go Again, so they had to bring in a group of all new players for yet another version. The 87 radio mix featured Denny Carmasi on drums and uh, Dan Huff on guitar, amongst others. The synthesizer intro was removed entirely, with Coverdell's lead vocal transitioning much faster into the first verse. If you think about it and really remember, MTV was basically the White Snake video channel in 87 and 88. The videos for the first three singles from the, the White Snake 87 album, they were all in power rotation on this network, including Is This Love, which of course, it was a Stone Cold Smash. It went to number two on the Billboard Hot 100, and it also went to number 13 on the mainstream rock chart. Now, the treatment for the trio of videos had an iconic common thread, the stunning sex symbol, the late Tawny Katane. Tawny was the eye catcher for all three White Stank music videos, but her cartwheel gymnastics on the hoods of two Jaguars in the clip for Here I Go Again, it was truly one of the most memorable spectacles of the MTV heyday. It was one of the most iconic moments of the entire year. Katane was actually not the first choice for the female figure in the White Stank videos, though. The role of the White Snake woman was supposed to go to Claudia Schiffer. You know, this is when she was the guest jeans girl. But uh, Schiffer dropped out just before shooting the Still of the Night video. Uh, David Coverdell and Tawny had just started to date. And actually, the couple were about to leave for dinner one evening when Marty Kellner, uh, when he called and he informed David that they had problems and insisted that David come over immediately to discuss this. So David and Tawny scurried to uh, Marty's home. And according to Coverdell, when Marty opened the door, his jaw hit the floor. That's her! Marty effused while pointing at Katane. Problem solved. Tawny Katane became the White Snake Woman and a rock video goddess forever, eternally. Coverdell and Katane married in 89, actually, and they divorced two years later. The gut instincts of John Collotter did not fail him. The revamp of Here I Go Again was a towering number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100, which was really something. I mean, you think about it, White Snake passed up the megastars of the era, including Michael Jackson and Prince and Whitney Houston. Uh, it was a huge victory for hard rock and for metal. Here I go. 
and it far outperformed the original version in the UK, ascending to number nine. It was also number one in Canada and several other countries. The White Snake album sold more than 8 million copies in America and over 10 million worldwide. Here I Go Again has established a legacy as an anthemic classic rock standard with a dual meaning that is a word of the song, timeless emotional resonance. The track is a rousing soundtrack of, of self-reflection with both the original 82 version and the seminal 87 version, beginning with the contemplative keyboard intro flowing under David Coverdale's heartfelt soul searching in the first verse. I don't know where I'm going, but I sure know where I've been. Hanging on the promises and songs of yesterday, and I made up my mind, I ain't wasting no more time. So here I go again. I ain't wasting no more time. Here I go again. It's the kind of jukebox poetry that has lifted my spirit, and I'm sure yours, too many times to mention. The chorus of Here I Go Again marshals energy to turn away from the past and you know, rush forward with what lies ahead in your life's journey with a conquering David Coverdell proclamation. Here I go again on my own, going down the only road I've ever known. And here I go again on my own. Like a drifter, I was born to walk alone, but I made up my mind, I ain't wasting no more time. The second verse is where we pick up the veracity of Coverdell's story of the song's origin, sharing the heavy burden of heartbreak and the inevitable loneliness that really accompanies it. I'm just in their heart in need of rescue, waiting on love's sweet charity. Waiting on love's sweet charity. And I'm gonna hold on for the rest of my days because I know what it means to walk along the lonely street of dreams. I mean, the motivational power of the tune Substance has made Here I Go Again a pop culture phenomenon. Among the highlights, it was a theme song for boxer Mickey War, portrayed by Mark Wahlberg in the 2010 movie The Boxer, along with placement in the films Man Up in 2015, Rock of Ages in 2012, and Here I Go Again on My Own, Adventureland in 2009, Old School in 2003. And what you did last summer in 98, and my favorite use in 2019, here I go again, was the music track and the Glory of Love episode of the series Cobra Kai, where it was used in uh, that dream sequence with Johnny Lawrence hooking up in a tryst with the mother of his prized karate student. It was recently used in the Melissa McCarthy comedy adventure Thunder Force, and also the TV series The Man Who Fell to Earth. Now, the most widely known sinking of Here I Go Again was in TV advertisement for Geico and the 2016 back to school campaign for Walmart. Here I go again, oh my. In 2006, VH1 named Here I Go Again as the 17th greatest rock song of the 80s. It's a song that's been a, a pick me up, like I said, a motivator for me whenever I've felt like throwing in the proverbial towel. So here's a story that I remember well. When I was in the sixth grade, uh, there were two things that I collected and was obsessed with. Music and comic books. Uh, comic books, I had about 500 of them. It's kind of like the comic book nerd of the town. There was a girl that I was in love with since the fifth grade. She was popular and at the time I was kind of a zero. I of course made her mixtapes and sent over notes that would say, will you go with me? With, you know, the yes, no, or maybe check boxes. You know what I'm talking about. You grew up in the 80s, for those of you who did. For a year, I was chasing this girl and being rejected right and left. Finally, the day before Valentine's Day, 1988, her friend came over and told me that this girl would go with me if I just throw away all my comic books. In essence, she was trying to make me shed the comic book geek status that I had. Well, I'll tell you, I was only 11 or 12. I didn't know who I was. I still cared what people thought of me. I wouldn't learn the lessons that, you know, Robert Smith or the Kieran Morrissey of the Smiths would teach me in songs for another year or so. I was blinded by my schoolboy crush for this girl, so I committed to throwing out every single one of my comic books. That day I went home and along with a few friends, I packed up all my comic books 
and I hauled them to the nearby dump. That's what we called it. It was a sad day, but alas, I was about to win the heart of my sixth grade crush. Since the next day was Valentine's Day, I spent most of my allowance on a stuffed bear holding a rose with some balloons, you know what they used to do back in the day. The next day I walked up to her. She, uh, remember she was wearing guest jeans and a pink Esprit shirt, a totally rad swatch and huge neon hoop earrings. She kind of looked like uh, Mercedes from that Corey Feldman, Corey Haim 80s movie, License to Drive, you remember that. I don't need the BMW anymore. Les! Told her my brave sacrifice of getting rid of hundreds of comic books, including the entire run of Gru the Wanderer, every single Mad Magazine since the 70s, and Peter Porker the Spectacular Spider-Ham. So I handed her my gift, this teddy bear, and we walked down the hall holding hands. I was on top of the world. I went from geek to chic. For the next few periods, I was on top of the world. I was on cloud nine. I had the girl of my dreams. I... Anyway, the last class of the day, I actually sat by my crush. Um, and halfway through that class, she passed me a note. I was so excited. I opened it with a cool bravado. So it said, Adam, thanks for the V-Day gift. You're such a nice guy. Let's just be friends. P.S. You're dumped. Dumped. I read it again to make sure that my eyes hadn't deceived me. Dumped on Valentine's Day after throwing away my, my prized comic book collection? I was devastated. Easy come, easier go. From that point forward through the end of school, that school day, I was the laughing stock. I walked down the halls and people were pointing and laughing at me because everybody knew that I'd thrown away my comic book collection, 500 comic books, only to get kicked to the curb by this girl. She would really only agreed to go out with me or to go with me uh, to get a Valentine's gift. I mean, that was obvious. Forget about humiliating me. Now, as I rode the bus home in utter turmoil and heartbreak, as only a, a sixth grader can feel, I found my only relief, the only medicine that could get me through this pain, my Walkman. I searched my tapes for the perfect song to drown away my sorrows. And just then White Snake's self-titled cassette fell out on the ground. You know, I hurriedly grabbed it, I snapped it into my, my player, hoping to hear, is this love? You know, to get me through this. Instead, I heard, here I go again. Must have put it on the wrong side. As this song blasted into my ears, instead of wallowing in my self-pity, David Coverdale's words of wisdom washed over me like a beacon of defiance and strength, motivation. I, don't know where I'm going. I was a drifter born to walk alone, and I wasn't going to waste any time feeling sorry for myself. I was going to pick myself up again and walk down that lonely street of dreams, hanging on to the promises and songs of yesterday. And you know what? I'm still doing it. I mean, seriously, this empowering 80s song by White Snake continues to be that beacon of strength for so many of us. And, here I go again on my own. and you know what I did? That day, I took the last of my allowance, I had a little bit left, I went down to the store and I restarted my comic book collection all over again. I got the latest issue of The Amazing Spider-Man. I think I also picked up uh, David Lee Ross' album, Skyscraper. Thanks to David Coverdell, I was gonna be just fine. Man, they don't make them like they used to. Like a gifter, I was born to walk along. Hey, leave us a comment on this incredible song. Tell me about an experience that you had where a song gave you a huge lift when you were down. I love to hear your stories. Tell me your memories of White Snake's self-titled album of this song. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe. We'd love to have you as part of our, our daily community. We talk about songs. It's all about keeping the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friend.